Good afternoon, everyone. This is Katie Cook from Adirondack Health Institute. Welcome to the July Telehealth Learning Collaborative. Thank you for joining us today. We have a really packed agenda, which I sent out this morning, so hopefully you have that in front of you. Today's speaker, um, we're going to jump right into it, is Jessica Adams. She is the Manager of Regulatory Affairs for Telefarm, which is a cardinal health company. Telefarm provides telepharmacy software that enables remote prescription verification and live video counseling with patients. So Jessica's gonna, Jessica is going to talk with us today about what telepharmacy is, why it's important, different types of telepharmacy, where regulation stands in New York State, and some different statistics and workflows on how we can adopt this regulation. So I'm going to go ahead and share the PowerPoint. And just bear with me one second. How do I get this thing out of the way? There we go. Slideshow. All right, Jessica, you can go ahead. There we go. Awesome. Go ahead, Jessica. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, Katie. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Perfect. Well, well thank, thank you for you the kind information. information. Today, I will be providing you all with a brief presentation on telepharmacy. I'll be assigning what it is, sharing the history, providing some examples, and then why we're discussing some New York information and where New York currently stands. Next slide, please. So why telepharmacy? Healthcare in the world around us is changing, so why not use improvements in technology, such as telepharmacy, to improve patient adherence, and in doing so, enable access to a pharmacist or pharmacy services in medically underserved areas. This includes both your rural communities, as well as your more recent applications and sometimes less understood urban areas. Next slide, please. So before fully defining what telepharmacy is, I think it's easier to say what telepharmacy is not. Telepharmacy is not telemedicine. It's not internet pharmacy or even mail order pharmacy. In fact, the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy loosely defines telepharmacy as providing pharmaceutical services by way of telecommunications and information technologies to patients remotely or at a distance. So just like traditional pharmacy, it can be broken down into inpatient and outpatient settings. And in these settings, it can be broken down further. So when you're inpatient setting, you've got remote order entry, and this is where pharmacists can be located on different floors of a hospital, reviewing and examining orders. Next, you have IV admixture. In this setting, a pharmacist can be in an adjacent room and rather than having to constantly garb up or garb down to verify orders, they can view them through technology on a screen in an adjacent room. Next, we have outpatient pharmacy. And the first model I'll be discussing is retail pharmacy, which I'll go into more on the next screen. And then lastly, remote counseling. And this is where a pharmacist can uh, be telecommunicating with a provider and a patient during a, uh, an appointment and go over their medication regimen, address any, address any duplications in therapies, drug interactions, and any questions or problems they may encounter. Next slide, please. So I mentioned telepharmacy in a retail workflow model. On the screen here, we've got an example of what that would look like. On the left-hand side, we've got a patient who would drop off a prescription at a telepharmacy, which is a brick and mortar location, and they would hand it to the technician. The technician then completes data entry and putting all the relevant information from the prescription into the computer system and taking any pertinent images of the prescription as well, whether it be the prescription label, tablet, stock bottle with the lot number and expiration date, any information they feel is necessary to send to the pharmacist. That information is then sent electronically via an electronic basket to the pharmacist located at a supervising pharmacy or pharmacy B in a nearby town or city. <clears throat> The pharmacist then reviews this prescription for accuracy and marks it for consultation. The patient then returns to the telepharmacy later on in the day to pick up the prescription. And before, and it is not until they speak with the pharmacist, excuse me, that the technician can then sell them the prescription. Next slide, please.
So telepharmacy initially developed because there's a steady decline in the number of independent pharmacies. This is not seen in just one part of the country, it's seen throughout the entire United States. So during this 15 year period from 2003 to 2018, not only did 1,231 independent rural pharmacies close, but 630 rural communities lost their only pharmacy. What do those patients then do without pharmacy services? And not even just your dispensing services, the other comprehensive services that pharmacists can provide. Next slide, please. So as a response to the rural pharmacy closures, North Dakota passed telepharmacy laws in 2002. With support from the state and the Board of Pharmacy, North Dakota Dakota State University ran a study in 2002 to 2008, 81 telepharmacies in the hospital setting, we analyzed the safety of telepharmacy. By the end of the study, the results were clear. Not only did it establish the credibility of telepharmacy, but it was often proven to be safe. As you can see on the screen here, the medication dispensing error rate for telepharmacies was at 1.3%, meaning it was less than the national average of 1.7%. Now, while I mentioned this proved the safety of telepharmacy, additional studies still needed to complete it to analyze patient satisfaction, the impact to clinical services and consultations, and most importantly, the effect it has on adherence. Next slide, please. So patient adherence is a major problem. In fact, it makes up about 13% of all healthcare spending or $290 billion per year. Now, these numbers support the vast size of the issues, but they don't tell the full story. In fact, IMS Health defines non-adherence or breaks it down kind of like a leaky bucket. Out of 100 every new prescriptions, 50 to 70 arrive at a pharmacy, 48 to 66 are picked up by the patient, 25 to 30 are taken properly, but only 15 to 20 are refilled as prescribed. So as a pharmacist and as operators, we kind of like to think of how we can work backwards to help improve this numbers. There's refill reminder programs, calls, text messages, emails, all are helped to ensure that prescriptions are refilled and picked up. And then pharmacists and specifically access to a pharmacist can help further ensure each of these. But how do you make sure that patients actually arrive at a pharmacy, that bucket where there's 50 to 70 people? Some of us may say, well, there's a pharmacy on every corner. Well, that may be true in most parts of the country, but it's not true in other areas, particularly your med medically underserved areas. Next slide, please. So medically underserved area is any area with a lack of access to healthcare services. This includes primary care services, healthcare services, dental services, and can even include your pharmacy services. New York State actually has 132 medically underserved areas. So this not only includes whole counties, but it can actually be small areas or areas where groups may face economic, cultural, or linguistic barriers to healthcare. So I put on the screen here, examples of this can be seen with your rural pharmacy deserts or areas that are greater than 10 miles to the nearest pharmacy or your urban pharmacy desert, which are areas that are greater than one mile to the closest pharmacy. Next slide, please. So how rural is rural? About 64 million Americans live in rural areas and 77% of rural counties are considered healthcare pro professional shortage areas. And pharmacists are definitely lumped into these categories. Next slide, please. So on this slide is an example of a rural telepharmacy that opened up in Iowa. Uh, it's run by a physician assistant. And when the only pharmacy in town closed, she noticed that she was also losing patients. She heard about telepharmacy and coupled with a pharmacy located in the next town and put a telepharmacy in her clinic. She noticed that once she opened, patients were not only returning, but their results and their values were actually improving. After several months, she was doing so well, she had to move the pharmacy into the next building on the right-hand side of the screen and had to hire a different, another provider to help accommodate the additional patients and services. Next slide, please. So rural areas were the initial focus of telepharmacy. And just like telehealth, telepharmacy is moving into your more urban areas. One study out of the University of Illinois in Chicago found that over 1 million residents live greater than one mile to the nearest pharmacy. Now that may not sound kind of far, but imagine if you have to take one or two buses to get to your doctor's office, and then another one or two buses to get to your closest pharmacy. This study found that patients were actually skimping out on their doses, and let's say it was insulin, reducing those doses altogether to make them last longer, obviously impacting their adherence and their uh, additional outcomes. 
This can be seen similarly in any other metropolitan area. So this could be New York City, San Francisco, Detroit, all the cities that you can think of kind of fall into this category. Next slide, please. So this is a slide that's a picture of an adult medicine clinic that provides specialized services in geriatrics, women's health, diabetes, and hypertension. The providers noticed that their patients were not adherent to their medications and heard about telepharmacy. So they opened up a telepharmacy in the clinic and within a couple of months, they noticed that the adherence rates and their patients' outcomes were improving. So same idea as we saw in the rural setting as well. Next slide, please. This is an example of a telepharmacy in a federally qualified health center in Chicago. Once patients finish their appointment, they can go directly across the hall and pick up their prescriptions at the telepharmacy and speak with the pharmacist whenever they need to if they have questions about the medication, OTC medications, anything like that. Next slide, please. So the opportunities for telepharmacy truly are endless. You can use it to workload balance, connecting various different locations across the city or metropolitan area to help even out the distribution of pharmacists. They can share the workload. In your hospital settings for a remote order entry and IV verification, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, your pharmacy deserts in both your urban and rural settings. And then lastly, to use for accessible specialists. So let's say you have an HIV clinic and patients unfortunately have a stigma associated with the disease state and may not feel comfortable filling their prescriptions to begin with. To further that, if they go to a big box pharmacy, they may not encounter a pharmacist who's been completely or efficiently trained or residency trained in HIV services. You put a telepharmacy in that HIV clinic, they're amongst peers and people they are more comfortable with, and you can connect them with an HIV certified pharmacist who can provide much more of a tailored consultation and services. So the same idea can be used for any disease state, whether it be high blood pressure, diabetes, pediatrics, geriatrics, psych health, the opportunities truly are endless. Next slide, please. So people often ask, what does a telepharmacy look like? Well, on the screen, you can see it looks exactly like a traditional pharmacy. You've got your inventory and some stores even have an OTC or a section outside of the pharmacy where they can pick up other items and goods. Next slide, please. There are economic, there are benefits to, economic benefits excuse me, to telepharmacy as well. Results from that six-year study out of North Dakota showed that 81 locations brought in $26.5 million in economic development. Not only did it do that, but it created 8,100 new jobs. In Illinois, that study with the University of Chicago, created, one pharmacy creates over $640,000 of annual economic impact. And one thing to note is this money stays in the state. It stays in the town where that telepharmacy is created and stays in the state. Whereas your other opportunities like mail order, that those funds may be moved out of state wherever that company is, corp, is uh, cord, uh, headed, headquartered. Excuse me. Next slide, please. Another question I get is telepharmacy actually legal? So this is a map of 2008 telepharmacy regulations, and you can see it was only permitted in eight states. Next slide, please. As of 2019, that regulatory map has drastically changed. You can see there's about 23 states that permit some form of telepharmacy with about 10 states, your states in gray, that are progressing towards permitting telepharmacy fully. I'm sure you're wondering, where does New York State stand? Next slide, please. As of today, there is no regulatory language for telepharmacy. In fact, there have been bills that have been gone through the legislature since 2009 and unfortunately been referred to higher education every year since then. So there definitely needs some action to be permitted, to be fully permitted. Next slide, please. So current New York statistics, there's over 200,000 residents that live in a pharmacy desert. And this is greater than 10 miles to the closest pharmacy. And this is, as you can see on the map here, there's about 136 pharmacy deserts located throughout the state. And there's 45 at-risk communities. These are communities that have only one pharmacy. So if they close, those communities do not have a pharmacy at all. And those patients then end up living in a pharmacy desert. There's also currently 513 cities without a pharmacy. And New York State actually has 317 healthcare provider shortage areas. This includes mental health and primary care. And I include this on here because pharmacists can also provide interventions in both of these disease states or in primary care and mental health services. Next slide, please. So telepharmacy truly is an opportunity. It provides greater convenient access to a pharmacy and pharmacist. 
It's been proven safe and effective, not only through the North Dakota study, but also the 23 states that now permit some form of telepharmacy. Studies have also shown that you have more one-on-one -on -one time with a pharmacist for counseling in a telepharmacy setting than you do when you walk into a traditional pharmacy. You get less delays in treatment since people can pick up their prescriptions faster. Pharmacy services are restored or established, provides a positive economic impact in your local rural communities. And most importantly, the scope of practice has not changed. The pharmacist and pharmacy technicians are all doing all the same duties and tasks they do in a traditional pharmacy setting. The only difference is through the use of technology. On the right hand side, you can see there is a graph showing poll results from patients who are plagued with pharmacy closures. And not to read everything on the screen, but the highest percent at 37% was telepharmacy with pharmacy consultation. And this is a comparison to home delivery, mail order, or using Uber or Lyft services to deliver your medication. Next slide, please. So now I wanted to open it up for any questions if you guys had any about telepharmacy and where it stands today. Thank you, Jessica. So if anybody on the line wants to submit a question, please do so through the Q&A box and we will make sure that Jessica gets those. We'll just wait a second to give people a chance to submit questions. Additionally, as always, the slides and recording of this session always get sent out within several days following the end of the learning collaborative, so stay tuned for that email as well. And, and Jessica, I have a quick question for you. To maybe help move along telepharmacy in New York State, what have you seen occur in other states where legislation has been passed? Is it simply advocacy? Yes, all, like advocacy, is, advocacy, excuse me, is definitely one of the primary points and whatever group that has interest in it, you can definitely reach out to your local legislator and see where they stand on it and get them involved. Okay, and I actually don't see any questions in the Q&A box. So thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. And, oh, a question did come in, my apologies. So why are prescribers using ERX not providing pickup data from their, hold on, this question's kind of odd and I can't see it. Um, Daniel Reuter, if you could retype your question, um, it looks like it might've gotten cut off, but it, it looks like he's asking why are prescribers using ERX and not providing pickup data from their pharmacies? I'm not entirely sure what that question is asking. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Jessica. Not particularly. Okay. <laughs> um, so what are some of the reasons that legislators give as to why New York does not permit this? I don't know if that's something you could answer. <laughs> I honestly do not know the answer to that. I know when I followed up with the State Board of Pharmacy, they said it's just required additional education. And I would imagine there's things that are more important or more pressing on their list of topics, or they don't have enough support or haven't heard enough from the public to push it forward. Okay, fair enough. Another question came through, Jessica. Can you please be more specific about the advantages for telepharmacy for health professional shortage areas? Yes, yeah, so as a pharmacist, pharmacists can provide multiple different clinical services, whether it be blood pressure measuring, diabetes consultation, the opportunities, and I could go on forever about what we can do as pharmacists. And I, in working as one, did a lot of them when I was working. If you put a pharmacist connected in an area where they may not have a primary care provider, the patients can follow up with the pharmacist more often to help see how they're doing and progressing in their, their disease. Whether it be doing a brown bag special or an MTM or a complete med review, going over their entire profile of medications, checking any duplications, any drug interactions, immunizations they need, all of these things a primary care provider provides as well as a pharmacist can. And you can okay. get more specific when you throw in something like HIV care, a pharmacist can provide those services as well. Now, depending on state regulations, they can provide more or less. That also just varies according to your state. Okay. Thank you for answering that. 
Um, would this program, if allowed, fall under the Education Department in New York State or DOH? Now, that may be a question for Megan Program, who I know is on the line. Hi, yes, this is Megan. It would f actually fall under State Education Department and the State Board of Pharmacists. Because Department of Health, we don't license um, pharmacy. Okay. And all, the, and all of the great uh, scope of practice work that our speaker detailed um, would be overseen by our state board. Okay. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And another question came in. Now questions are starting to come in. <laughs> Does Pharmacy B have a pharmacist on staff? If so, why would you not send the prescription directly there? Yes, so Pharmacy B does have a pharmacist on staff, and I don't know, Katie, if you could go back to that slide. Uh, give me one second. Uh, and I can chat about it real quick while you're pulling it up. If you look sure. at that workflow model, your telepharmacy is the Pharmacy A, which is located in your pharmacy desert. So they may not have a pharmacy at all. It could be 50 miles from your Pharmacy B. What so slide was that? Do you remember? Uh, slide four. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just repeat what I said. <laughs> I'll hold on question. while I, the WebEx is acting a little funny right now. Give me a second. Okay. Yes, that one. There we go. Okay, so your pharmacy A is your telepharmacy, which is located in the pharmacy desert, whether it's an urban or rural setting. So let's say, example, it's a rural setting. Your host pharmacy or supervising pharmacy, where the pharmacist is located, could be 50 miles away. So imagine if you're sick and you live in a small town, are you going to want to drive 50 miles to drop off your prescription and then drive 50 miles back home? So that's why they would drop it off at pharmacy A. So Pharmacy A, no, does not have a pharmacist on site. There's just a technician. Okay. Um, so Pharmacy A does not have a pharmacist? Exactly, yeah. Just okay. has a technician. And the technician, in a traditional pharmacy setting, the same thing happens. They hand a prescription to the technician who types in and inputs it, and then it's sent to the pharmacist. You're just removing the pharmacist from that location and putting them in a supervising pharmacy. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'll, so another question came through. So the pharmacy technician can disperse the medication? And that is where the law would have to be changed. Okay. If that makes sense. I believe New York State that your personnel in a pharmacy have to be immediately supervised, meaning the pharmacist has to be present. And that's why the law has to be updated. Okay. That makes sense. Something to keep in mind. Yeah, and depending how dispense is defined in the law, would also it may have to be addressed as well. Okay, I think that's what current state is, so that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I am not seeing any other. Oh, one more question came in. So a provider has a practice. So his practice sends all of the prescriptions via e-fax. It would be particularly useful if they could receive information on whether or not the prescription was picked up. This is particularly true for wait and see type prescriptions. Does telepharmacy help with that at all? It depends honestly on the software and all that can vary per company. Okay. And I hate and, providing that answer, but that's ultimately what it comes down to, yeah. Okay, and does your, I assume your company provides that software as well? Uh huh. You can generate reports on what's been picked up and what hasn't, and times and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. Another question that came through was, how do you safeguard um, with controlled substances? And that honestly can vary according to site and your policy and procedures. Most states follow their same law as traditional pharmacies. The only two states that do not, Texas does not allow Schedule Twos, and Tennessee only allows Schedule Fives. 
Okay. And then in terms of security and storage, usually the same thing follows as a traditional pharmacy. They have to be locked up and separated from your other prescriptions. And then only the technician and pharmacist have access to that. And then a lot of states require a pharmacist to be on site at least monthly to do a perpetual inventory and reconcile that with what the technician has counted and dispensed. Okay. Thank you. I am not seeing any other questions. Um, oh, I, I, every time I say that, another one comes in. <laughs> Is, and I, I think this may have been answered already, but are you aware of any work currently being done to change the law so that telepharmacy can happen in New York State, other than what you talked about on that one slide, which I'll go to that slide here for you, Kelly, who asked. That's slide 19. Yes. And um, as I know of right now, no. We're trying to increase advocacy and support throughout the state, but other than what's on the slide, that's as far as I know. Okay. All right. I, I think that wraps up our telepharmacy conversation. So thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate you being on and taking the time to present to us in New York State, and we can only hope that over the next couple of years, telepharmacy will be a reality for our state as well. No problem, right. thank you. Thanks. So moving along on the agenda, of course, we always have on there a standing update from the Department of Health. Um, Megan, if you would like to provide an update, feel free to. If not, we'll keep moving along. Oh, sure. Good, good afternoon, everyone. This is Megan. Um, we're still working across uh, our agencies, state agencies, working with OMH, OSS, and OPWDD um, and in, in the department, our Medicaid program, to develop a interagency gui a guidance document regarding reimbursement and, regu and regulation of telehealth in New York. And one of the major things we had been waiting on was the um, recent regulatory changes uh, through Office of Mental Health. So um, what now that those have been adopted, we'll, uh, we'll be working to finalize our, our draft guidance document and then um, be able to uh, get approvals for publication. Excellent. Thank you very much for that update. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. So we'll go ahead and move along. Um, so for OMH, Amy Smith, who normally speaks on this uh, webinar, was not able to attend today. But as many of you may know, OMH released their updated telemental health um, regulatory changes on the July 3rd register. So the, the guidance that would go along with these changes has been mostly updated and is now in review with several other divisions. OMH is going to be including specifics regarding use in ACT and PROS programs and treatment settings. And Amy said they're hopeful to have this finished by the end of this month. Um, you can, of course, feel free to forward any questions along to myself or Amy and I'll share those with her. But some highlights from the Part 596 expansion include uh, changing the title from telepsychiatry to telemental health to make it more encompassing of the new eligible practitioner types that have been now included, which are licensed psychologists, licensed social workers, and all licensed under Article 163 of the state education law which includes mental health counselors, marriage and family therapists, creative arts therapists, and psychoanalysts. So um, previously, the regulations were only psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners, so this is a huge positive change for OMH in New York State. Additionally, uh, the hub or distance site was expanded to include home offices and private practices. And now prescribers, so your psychiatrists, physicians, and psychiatric nurse practitioners, may be located anywhere within the U.S. And the other practitioner types, so the psychologists, social workers, counselors, therapists, can be located anywhere in New York State. 
Additionally, the spoke or originating site is now anywhere the client is located within New York State or other temporary location within or outside New York State. And lastly, the um, regulatory changes include ACT and PROS as eligible treatment settings. Current exclusions include use for medication over objection, restraint and seclusion ordering, and involuntary admissions. So again, Amy's not on the line today, so if you have specific questions about these changes, feel free to send them my way. And as soon as I see that finalized guidance, I will share it with the group. The July 3rd register, I'll also include that with the meeting notes. So next up on the agenda is usually an update from OASAS, but I am not seeing my OASAS person on the line today. Again, any questions related to OASAS, you can always forward to their email, which is um, oasas at legal.ny.gov. And next up on the agenda, I wanted to add OPWDD into the conversation because they are going to be a part of this interagency statewide telehealth guidance, which is expected to come out later this year. Um, my OPWDD contact um, today, and just bear with me one second while I uh, get her set up. It's usually Virginia Scott Adams, but um, today it will be um, Margaret. So I'm just going to get her situated. Bear with me one second. So Margaret, um, if you can unmute your line, you can provide an update to the group. Just bear with us one second while we get her ready to go. She may not be able to do that. There we go. Katie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Um so my name is Margaret Vijayan. I work um, in counsel's office in OPWDD, and I work with Dr. Scott Adams on the telehealth uh, project that we're working on here. Um, we updated our clinical services regulation last year to allow for uh, clinical services delivered via telehealth. We removed the face-to-face -face requirement. So at this point, we are working to finalize our ADM, which will include all of the um, clinical guidance on how um, telehealth should be done in our service delivery system. So we are getting close to wrapping up our ADM, and then once we land on that, we'll have a more meaningful contribution for the interagency um, guidance document that I believe Megan referenced before. Um, and we're right now working on clarifying our billing procedures just to make sure that um, the reimbursement for the services delivered via telehealth are all set. So that's where we're at right now in our agency. Excellent. Thank you so much, Margaret. Not a problem. If any questions happen to pop through the q and I'll, I'll let you know, but none have come through. Um, so next up on the agenda was an update from the St. Peter's Health Partner Group. Um, they have recently come out with a new project ECHO related to uh, medication assisted treatment. So I'm just going to check and see if the individual who's going to speak to this today is on the line. His name is Patrick. Um, I am unfortunately not seeing him on the line, so I will speak to it. Um, just bear with me one second while I pull up the flyer. Okay. So. Uh, this is a no-cost telementoring lunch and learn program. So St. Peter's Health Partners, which is a group out of the Capital District, is putting forth a 12-week telementoring program focused on recovery through medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. This starts on Wednesday, September 18th from 12 to 1 p.m. And it's 12 weeks, so it runs through December 4th of this year. You can call or video chat from your phone. There's no cost to the provider, no travel, and no equipment needed. 
These will be one hour case based clinical discussions to improve provider confidence in guiding patients through recovery and enhance overall collaboration efforts for OUD treatment in New York State. Participants will receive 12 hours of continuing education credit at the completion of the 12 week course. It's provided at no cost by St. Peter's Health Partners and Trinity Health in partnership with Project ECHO. So the individuals who should participate in this are prescribers, primary care or behavioral care providers, social workers, peer support specialists, care managers, or healthcare professionals serving individuals with um, OUD. Registration is required and space is limited. I will be sending out the one-page flyer and a few slides on this with the meeting notes. Jessica Wright is the contact for this, and I really think this is a great free way to get continuing education credits and some additional guidance in treating patients in recovery. So updates on the North Country Telehealth Partnership, um, the last part of our agenda today. So. Um, a quick um, update, we have a lot going on here on the AHI front. Um, one of the new updates that I have for all of you that's really pertinent to the North Country, so specifically the nine counties that the AHI PPS serves, which are Warren, Washington, Clinton, Essex, uh, Franklin, Hamilton, Fulton, St. Lawrence, and Saratoga. We received a Charles R. Wood Foundation grant about a month and a half ago to really hone in on expanding work for telehealth in the North Country. So again, this work that I'm about to describe is only happening in the North Country, and I know a lot of you on the line are not in the North Country, so just keep that in mind. But Nancy Del Mastro is on the line. Say hi, Nancy. Hello. Nancy is our new telehealth project specialist, and she is going to be overseeing the bulk of this work. Um, the intent of the Charles R. Wood Foundation grant is to eventually create um, a telehealth technical assistance center of sorts. We're still in the planning phases of what exactly that will look like. But in the nine counties I just mentioned, um, we will be doing a community needs assessment as well as a listening tour and, and really getting out there in the community, talking to community members, providers, leadership um, from all sectors of healthcare and beyond to really define what assets are existing in the North Country and where are the gaps and, and how we can take that and lift some of those efforts up. So we're really excited here to, to do that work which will um, flow well into the work of the existing telehealth partnership. So a couple of um, a couple of other updates. So as of late in many conversations with many of you on the line, um, there has been a great need for therapists, licensed mental health counselors, and social workers to provide their services via telehealth. Um, typically, I don't have much of an issue finding psychiatrists to provide telehealth services, but it's those other practitioner types that are now allowed through OMH um, that can really be a great asset to the North Country and beyond. So if any of you on the line know of any organizations or providers or facilities who are offering these services, um, please send any recommendations to either Bob Hunt or myself. Um, we could certainly use that help in the North Country. And then next up, a couple of North Country telehealth conference options, uh, updates. So the call for presenters application is due by next Friday, August 2nd. We've received an overwhelming response, so I'm super pleased to see that so many of you are interested in, in presenting at this event, and it's going to be very difficult to narrow that selection down. Next up, the Telehealth Innovator Award nominations will be going out the end of next week. Again, that is also limited to the North Country counties that I described earlier. And then lastly, a registration and the official invitation will be going out tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that email and that link. This conference has sold out the last two years. 
So if this is something that you're interested in, I highly recommend that you register sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, while I was talking, a question came in for you, Megan. It's, can a practitioner providing services from their office or from a licensed facility or hub site to patients at their residence charge a facility fee? So if a patient is in a home, can the provider charge that Q3014 code? So for Medicaid fee for service, the answer is no. That the Q3014 facility fee is typically only for an originating site if it's a, a, a provider that's really just doing the connection to a, a different distant site provider. So if the if the patient is in their residence, they're connecting. Um, and the distant site provider would then just be claiming for the the service that would be provided via telehealth. So uh, the it, so in that case, the originating site is their residence. Okay, thank you. And that's that's what I was thinking that you wouldn't be able to charge that code. Um, another question that came in, which I feel like I could answer yes to this, but um, certainly welcome your expertise. What would be an example of the ability to treat outside of New York due to temporary location? Example, would a student who is a New York resident and attends college in Ohio still be able to receive services from the New York provider while in school? Right, so this kind of speaks towards the Medicaid and now, you know, the OMH uh, regulations. So we're really looking just at, you know, allowability from a reimbursement side of things. Um, so, so when we say uh, uh, an, uh, an originating site can now include a patient's residence or other temporary location, uh, absolutely a college um, would, would fit into that. We're working on some specific language to help clarify this because our Medicaid program's getting, um, this, like this is probably their number one uh, question coming in. Um, so absolutely it could, a uh, temporary location may include um, college or other, uh, any place that's not a permanent address that they will, you know, they they have uh, a New York permanent address, but their addresses at college may be, you know, changing for the amount of time they're at college, but they will be returning home from Ohio in this instance to New York. It can also include things like a vacation. It can include just temporarily being outside of New York for a specific amount of time to, um, you know, to take care of family members. Um, it can, and then it also can include like a homeless shelter or other transitional housing. Um, but in terms of outside of the state, um, that is what we're, what we're talking about. And in our Medicaid guidance states that um, the, both the provider and the Medicaid member should, would need to be within the 50 U.S. states or other U.S. territories. So this could include um, Puerto Rico and other territories. Excellent, thank you for clarifying. So it doesn't look like any of the other questions have come through, so we will wrap it up for today. Um, we got through a lot in 45 minutes. So again, meeting notes, slides, all information I discussed will be included with the meeting notes as well as a link to the recording. Um, again, feel free to reach out to us, um, either Bob Hunt or myself, with any questions, and we will do our best to answer or connect you to the person who can. The next Telehealth Learning Collaborative is on Monday, September 16th, and um, we are looking for a speaker, so feel free to reach out if you have a topic that you think might be of interest to the group. Have a wonderful week, everyone, and keep an eye out for the registration link for the November conference. Have a great day.